So, uh, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, launch of the 2024 Innovation Report, the fourth edition. A very warm welcome to all of you here in the room, but also to all of you online as well. Uh, my name's Tim Minchell. I'm the Dr. John C. Taylor Professor of Innovation and Head of the Institute for Manufacturing at the University of Cambridge, and I'll be chairing today's launch event. I just have one more thing to do before we hand over to the main speakers, and that's just to, to give you a, a quick look at the agenda. But before we're doing that, just picking up on what that video said, this, this is a really critical time for UK industry. And it's pretty clear that if we're going to maintain or enhance our industrial or international industrial competitiveness to m make sure we have an economy which is resilient, which is sustainable, which is equitable, we absolutely need to be supporting innovation as effectively as possible. And so this report, as we saw earlier, really is a, a, a key resource to help us understand both the strengths and the weaknesses of where we are at the moment. So, to the agenda. Um, once I've finished these um, short welcoming remarks, I'm going to hand over to Lord David Sainsbury, who, amongst many other things, uh, it was our former uh, Minister for Science and Innovation, to set the scene. Then we'll hand over to two colleagues from Cambridge Industrial Innovation Policy, a part of the team that produced this, this excellent report. And it's going to be split into two parts. So first of all, we're going to have Dr. Carlos Lopez Gomez will give an overview of the whole report. And then, as happens with every one of these editions, there's been a deep dive into one or more industrial sectors. And this year, the sector chosen is that of machinery. And Dr. David Lial will explain that and why that sector was chosen uh, when he comes up onto the stage. Then we're going to switch to a uh, panel discussion. And we have an outstanding panel, uh, which we're very grateful for people giving up their time to contribute. And this is great, because it spans industry, government, and academia. So we'll have a discussion with them. And then we'll open things up to the audience, both here in the room and also online as well. I think um, whatever one's uh, political views, I think it's pretty obvious now to everyone uh, that in the UK, we're faced with a very difficult uh, economic situation. And if we're going to get out of that, uh, we have to dramatically increase our rate of growth. The only way we can compete is by creating competitive advantage in the new knowledge-intensive industries and services where we can potentially create competitive advantage because of our superior scientific and engineering knowledge and skills. Uh, we are involved in what I have called a race to the top, and we have to increase our rate of innovation if we're going to be successful. That is, this is why I think uh, the innovation report produced by the Cambridge Institute of Manufacturing uh, is so important. If we're going to raise our rate of innovation, it's not by making grandiose statements which say we are a scientific superpower, which is what often happens these days, but by systematically improving uh, the innovation performance of our companies. And to do that, we need the excellent detailed information uh, that is systematically set out uh, in the UK Innovation Report 2024. We need as a country to raise the level of R&D spending in industry and the skills of our workforce. We have an extraordinary record of scientific discovery, but we need to turn our scientific knowledge into new and attractive products which have a competitive advantage in world markets and therefore in can increase the value added per capita or wealth earned by our companies. And I think you'll find that the UK Innovation Report is a good place to start our thinking about what we need to do. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carlos Lopez Gomez. I am part of the Cambridge Industrial Innovation Policy Group at the Institute for Manufacturing. Now, my job together with David in the next 20 minutes is to give you an overview of the key messages emerging from the UK Innovation Report 2024. What is the UK Innovation Report and why do we produce it? The starting point, I think, as has been laid out already, is the recognition that achieving a healthy, prosperous economy requires industries that are innovative and produce well-paid jobs. There is widespread agreement on the importance of investment in research and innovation, and we monitor that very carefully. But we know less about how this investment impacts our industries, 
and whether it's making them more competitive or not. And when we analyze what is holding our economy back, we tend to focus on answers at the macroeconomy level. Our colleagues at ITIF, a well-known think tank in Washington, describe this as economic doctors treating all patients as the same, failing to identify key attributes of the patient, such as age and weight, before issuing a prescription. Actually, effective policy design needs to start with a sophisticated understanding of how different industries vary and how specific factors affect their performance. And from this, what kind of policy medicine our economy actually needs. And the Innovation Report does exactly that. It makes a contribution by bringing together innovation and industrial value-added indicators from multiple sources in a concise and accessible format. And throughout the report, we try to understand the contribution of individual sectors to the national economy, comparing the UK with other countries. And now this is the fourth edition of the report, and we believe that together, these reports serve as a tool to have a national conversation about the interplay between industrial and innovation performance. We'll present five key messages emerging from the report. And I'll start with the first one. The first one is that the UK is a global leader in scientific research and innovation. But the, the, we seem to be living in two worlds that coexist in the UK. That was the, on, the, on, the, on the one hand is this scientific leadership, but on the other, the UK's industrial sectors are facing significant challenges. And this graph helps us understand why this is difficult, why this is important. If you look at the yellow bit, this is medium and high-tech manufacturing. We see that in 2022, it accounted for only 4% of UK's gross value added and 2.4% of employment only. But it represented over 37% of UK's goods exports and more than 40% of business research and development expenditure in the country. So quite a critical industry for the health of the UK economy for various reasons. Now, this chart helps us understand the disconnect between these two worlds. If made, it makes a comparison of the performance of the UK with two leading countries, which is the US in blue and Germany in green. Using some key indicators across simplified stages of innovation, research, development, scale up, and value added. You can see that the UK in red performs better than US and uh, Germany by far. But not only actually, if you look at publications per capita, the UK outperforms every single country in the world. Other indicators tell us the similar story. UK is number one in the world for research quality, measured by citation impact, number two in the world for the number of Nobel Prize winning scientists. We have three of the top 10 universities in the world, and the UK is number four in the world for tech unicorns, which are startups valued at over $1 billion. But as you go to the right, and especially if we look at this bit of value added, you see the second world. The share of the population employed in high value added manufacturing in the UK is much lower than competitor, competitor countries. Value added per work, it is less than half of that of the US. And if you look back, manufacturing value added has declined from 16% of GDP in 1990 to around 8% in 2022, with over 300,000 manufacturing jobs lost over the last 10 years. These high quality, high wage roles are being replaced in many regions in the UK as we have explored in previous editions of the UK Innovation Report with low value added services. Now, compared to other countries, actually the UK has a relatively high proportion of STEM graduates at over 41% that as you, have, you can see in this pie chart. However, a key message that emerges from the report is that the E of engineering in STEM seems to be a missing piece. Within STEM disciplines, the percentage of graduates in engineering and technology in the UK was only around 15% with significant underrepresentation of women. If we look at the labor market, this is important because at the beginning of 2024, 12% of firms in manufacturing and 7% in ICT said that they were experiencing a shortage of workers. This graph 
shows in red, the red columns, that the UK's GDP doubled in the last three decades. And the yellow line shows that the country has achieved a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions during this period. So we can say that the decoupling between emissions and growth is going in the right direction. But much more work is needed because we need to take the yellow line all the way to zero or net zero by 2050, which is the national target. Now, the, from these sections, the picture that emerges is one of significant challenges for the future of UK industries. But also, if we take into account the UK's leadership in science and innovation, the industrial capabilities that still remain in the country, and the increasing recognition of their importance, bringing these two worlds together is a massive opportunity that actually very few countries have. And that's why it's great to see in the room people who care about this or who are working to make this happen. Um, good afternoon. My name is David Leal. I'm one of the co-authors of the report. And my task today is to take you through section three, as Carlos mentioned, which explores the performance of the machinery and equipment manufacturing sector in the UK. Now, you may or may not know, every year we choose one or two sectors to analyze in detail. In the past, we have done the pharmaceutical sector, automotive, aerospace, and food and drinks. And this year, we have chosen machinery, machinery and equipment. And the reason is why? There's a simple answer is because this sector makes a significant contribution to the UK economy. As you can see on the left, uh, it represents 7% of manufacturing value added, 6% of manufacturing employment, and 11.5% of manufacturing exports. And in addition, it has, uh, in terms of labor productivity, it has a 37% higher labor productivity than the average for manufacturing as a whole, and 60% higher than the whole economy. That's the direct impact of the sector. But also, this sector has an indirect impact in the sense that it's an enabler of productivity and competitiveness in other sectors of the economy. So the machines and the equipment that you produce for agriculture, for construction, for manufacturing, and for services, this is what allows other sectors to be competitive. No? So that's also a significant imp impact, and that's what makes it important. So as you can see, among OECD member countries, the UK has the fifth largest machinery and equipment sector with $22.2 billion. The sector is very heterogeneous, so it's actually quite complicated to analyze the sector. This tells you these are all the subsectors that compose the machinery and equipment sector. And this graph on the left, what is showing you is value added change between 2008 and 2021 in billion pounds. So overall, we know that the aggregated value added for the sector during this time period reduced by or declined by 5% between 2008 and 2021. But when you look at the subsectoral data, what you can see is that roughly half of the subsectors had a decline in value added, and the other half had an increase in value added. But what we know for the UK is also is that during this time period, the trade deficit widened from roughly $2 billion in 2011 to $7.2 billion in 2022. And it's actually one of the largest trade deficits in the world. Now, for this type of, we, consult, we consulted a few people in industry and government trying to understand what is going on, what explains the behavior of these data or the trends. A few uh, economic trends were mentioned across, of, across the different interviews. Obviously, it's difficult to generalize because different subsectors may have different drivers and trends. But we hear from different people that um, obviously this is a sector that depends strongly on the demand and, and performance of other economic sectors. So it's very susceptible to, to or sensitive to economic cycles and that may have affected the sector during this time period. Also, what we heard is that there was a, some, at least there's a perception that in some subsectors there was a significant amount of offshoring uh, related to potentially high production costs in, in the UK also political uncertainty, and also the fact that many of these large organizations or OEMs in this sector are foreign, and they, tried, they, they, they went through some consolidation moment where they consolidated operations outside of the UK. Also, in terms of trade, a lot of new regulations and intra-industry trade and policy changes in export markets had, uh, may have affected trade, particularly new trade rules with the European Union may have affected trade data. And in terms of uh, employment, well, 
almost every subsector, every person we talked to reported this labor shortages or, or shortage labor issues in terms of finding the right skills, both at the engineering level, but also at the technical level. So they mentioned this as a factor that may have constrained growth and actually incentivized in automation, particularly during the pandemic. Now to finalize, if I move into business expenditure on R&D, uh, the yellow line is showing the machinery and equipment sector for the UK, and the red line is for manufacturing as a whole, the, all of manufacturing in the UK. There's two key trends here. The first one is that for machinery and equipment, you can see that the number doubled between 2000 and 2022 to 1.4 uh, billion pounds. But you can see that business expenditure uh, in R&D for manufacturing actually grew at a faster rate. So the sectors, the R&D in the sector didn't grow as fast as it did in the rest of manufacturing. Now, we tried to ask, again, different people why they thought this was happening. And what we heard a lot, again, is that um, the biggest chunk, let's say, of R&D is done by large organizations, OEMs. And for many subsectors, these organizations are foreign. So there was a perception among consulted stakeholders that uh, a lot of the R&D investment decisions are made abroad. And in some cases, other countries are favored, or the, con the home countries of, of these organizations are favored. And also, there was a perception that, um, of course, there are examples of large organizations that are very successful, like JCB, that was represented here today, um, international. But basically, what we heard from different people is that perhaps there's not so many domestic OEMs in the sector. And actually, the sector is dominated by SMEs who, have, who struggle to invest in R&D because obviously they don't have so many resources and they have other constraints. Now, when we try to understand what innovation trends are driving the sector, it became clear from hearing or listening to different people that product innovation related to sustainability is key to competitiveness in this sector. So companies are really competing on putting out there in the market products that are more sustainable in different subsectors. So some examples, for example, for mining, querying, and construction equipment, um, what we heard is big need to innovate to be able to adapt to the European Union's stage five emission standards for non-road mobile machinery that aims to reduce particulate emissions and NOx emissions. So obviously the European Union is still a big market or export market for the UK. Involves and actuators, a strong, fo a strong focus on how can they develop new products to support the creation of the new hydrogen and carbon capture national, strat uh, national infrastructure. So big emphasis on this, how can they compete in this, these new markets. For pumps and compressors, big emphasis on energy efficiency. So energy is one of the biggest cost drivers of, in the operation of a pump and compressor. And efficiency has been improving through the years. But obviously, to be competitive internationally, you need to be doing more and more and more. And finally, agricultural equipment, a big push towards digitalization. So what we see already is that in the field, you can start to see very digitalized farms with self-driving satellite control machines and field robots. So a big emphasis on innovating towards digitalization to be competitive. All right, so a question we always start with, which is having looked at the report, was there something that was particularly surprising that stood out to you as being, oh, that's worthy of comment? And I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to comment on this, um, and perhaps starting with, sorry, but I, that Carlos won't be asked to comment on this because he wrote it. Um, Michael, could I start with you, please? Um, so firstly, uh, we really welcome the report. I think that it's fantastic to have the evidence and analytical base. Uh, and I really liked Carlos's introduction about the economic doctor and needing to know the patient. And I, I think the machinery and equipment deep dive is particularly welcome. I think a real reminder of the heterogeneous nature of these sectors. I mean, we talk about manufacturing, but you really need to understand each sector within that, as well as the kind of common challenges across it. Um, so that kind of really came out. And I, and I think kind of the, certainly the argument and what we'd seen in the data is our strength uh, in the M&E sector and comparative advantage. And it was fantastic to have further evidence uh, behind that. 
Um, yes, from, from our perspective, it was nice to see the equipment sector having a deep <coughs> dive because I think quite often it's that sector that underpins so much of what we do but, but sometimes gets a little forgotten. Um, and I think we've been through, uh, our sector is, is very much an importer rather than an innovator based in the UK. We're one of these uh, sectors that has European uh, partners and investors. So for us, it was very interesting to see those numbers and see how that works in other countries. And I think perhaps um, also for me, perhaps a little more focus on the servitization, whether you like that word or not, um, of how this sector works. Um, and that I'm sure we'll come on to later with, with the impact of, of other parts of the report. Yeah, I think one of the most sobering things I read, which not a huge part of a surprise to myself, was the amount of STEM graduates we have in this country and how that converts into, I think it was 12%, um, into engineering and manufacturing um, roles and jobs. And a key part of it, particularly from, from, from Make UK, is how do you change that perception that manufacturing is actually highly exciting, it's you know, high tech, it's digitalization. Um, so that actually you, you only see what you know, you only know what you see. And that is something we perennially think about in, in Make UK about the, changing the perception of uh, manufacturing plants not being dusty and full of um, men. <laughs> I can say that I'm a woman. Um, so yes, um, that was really uh, sobering. And it's something that we will definitely be using as sort of one part of our policy making. Great, thank you. Um, the machinery and equipment sector is strategic to the UK economy, um, it makes direct contribution. 11% you know, of export, 7% value add, 6% of jobs in the sector, you know, which is great to see. The machinery sector is 28% of the European output, which is fabulous. However, um, productivity aside, this sector has recorded poorer performance in the UK economy as a whole, um, and UK manufacturing too, which indicates to me it is yet to recover. We really agree with stuff that's, that's been said so far. And I mean, the board is massively useful, I think, for us as, us as kind of policy makers. I think my, so the big reflection on it was um, actually, if I think of the stuff around kind of net zero, where you can really see, and I think it quite so striking to describe it as that kind of that decoupling of the economy from, um, um, from kind of dependence on carbon. And I think what really hits me as a policymaker in the R&D space is that is a direct result of innovation and R&D. Um, and it shows it is possible to kind of align, I think, those, those grand government objectives um, with the interests and the needs of um, businesses to have a material impact um, on the economy <coughs> and beyond the economy on people's lives and, and kind of those wider objectives that kind of government, um, uh, government and the world has. So, yeah, I think it's really hit home the power of innovation to enact change and why it is worthwhile um, uh, investing in and driving that kind of change. Excellent. Thank you all very much for that. Sort of, I guess, two broad messages. One is somewhat of a disappointing one, that some of the things we've known about for years are still true, that issue of um, STEM engagement in manufacturing, uh, uh, more broadly, and particularly the gender issue. Um, that's a, yeah, problems we've known about for years, huge efforts being put in, and we don't see the numbers changing dramatically. But also the positive, the effect that is being had on things like the targets to move towards net zero. That's really encouraging to see. But what I'd like to do, if I may, is just drill down a little bit into some of the specific um, areas of the report. And this issue of the, the phrase that has been used for years and comes up again in the report, that of we're good at science, less good at innovation, less good at the industrial scale-up of what's going on there. Um, and while I would welcome comments from everyone on this who wishes to comment, could I maybe start, Faye, with you, if that's OK? Because we, with the statement is made, there is data to support it, but do you think it's an accurate perception of what is actually going on still? I think it's uh, broadly, yes. Um, I think, it, as a really poignant example, um, we were the leading, one of the leading nations in, in innovation when it came to offshore, offshore wind farms we were right at the forefront of, 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 of that um, thinking. But it hasn't translated into the manufacturing of, of, of uh, assembly, essentially. So whilst we, we do make some components in this country, by and large, we missed the boat in actually manufacturing this country. So we lost out a lot of that productivity and, and um, uh, added benefits to the economy. And I think we were just too slow off the mark. And I think that's partly it. it's it's not being as joined up as, as, as we could be, 
not having the the uh, almost like the conditions for the sector to quite quickly change um, and take hold of opportunities. It's really important um, to kind of to solve this challenge to have that kind of cooperation between central government, local um, uh, local leaders, and businesses themselves, because each of them has a lever it can pull. Each of them has insight that it can bring to the table to kind of shape and, and create those kind of systems you want, particularly when you think about those ecosystems from the kind of the cluster-based perspective, how we're creating those clusters of all the intensive firms in kind of one place. Um, uh, and that kind of cooperative working, I think, is the way, ultimately, that we will, uh, we will maximise the benefit of our investment in science, turn it into kind of productivity and growth. Um, and it's what we are working hard to do, underpinned by the great data and insight we get from reports like this. But I'd like to switch now, if I may, to the specific issues of the machinery and equipment sector and particular challenges facing its competitiveness. And Vanda, could I turn to you first for any thoughts or comments on specific issues that you see of concern? I think concern for us over the last few years has been about long-term strategy and long-term planning. You know, asking people to invest um, when they're not clear what, what the legislative and policy framework is going to look like is very hard for manufacturers. And as I said earlier, most of our manufacturers are European-based. Um, and you see the conversations that, that go on around the UK landscape and how they're going to interact with us in the future. So I think policy making is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. I think also supporting industry is critical. We talked about investment. We talk about, you know, if you look at the German uh, equipment sector and you look at the BAFA scheme, it's a very successful scheme in incentivizing companies within the country to draw from the equipment and, and renew themselves with equipment. So, so I think there are good policies out there. I just think sometimes we're not quick enough to take a good idea to capitalise policy. So for our industry at the moment, we have energy-related products, um, which is, is sitting, waiting uh, some form of understanding on how it's going to impact on our sector. Until our sector understands then the investment and the move forward is very difficult for, for any manufacturer, whether it be to import to our country or to, to create here and export. So I think there's some things we can do about speeding up policy making in a sensible way so that we know the landscape that we're going to work on in the future. And picking up one thing that both of you have mentioned, this issue of skills, and this is a, a topic that goes across all sectors, of course. But any comments, Vanda, particularly on the, on the skills side of things and the particular challenge where we see elsewhere huge demand for those with the digital skills, and now we have a relatively small pool of those who have the relevant digital skills, and are they relevant and ap applicable to the world of manufacturing and then specifically your sector? Any comments on that? So, so skills, if you spoke to our members, would be the skills and recruitment is, is the current conversation that they have with us continually, and whether it's a manufacturer, a supplier, or a distribution network, the, the conversation is consistent. Mm. And I think, again, when you talk about policy making and you talk about investment for the future, you know, we find that level two and level three apprenticeships, we had a, a policy written to say this should be em employer-led. So you lead it, you write the apprenticeships, and then we have a commercial college sector who can't afford to deliver um, a, an apprenticeship for a level two or level three skilled individual. Now, it, it, somewhere there, there's some disconnect, and if we're not training our young people of the future, um, and I was interested to see the announcements earlier this week, and while funding for SMEs is always welcome, I don't think any of our members is saying we don't want to fund training or funding of training is an issue. Um, what they're saying is give us the hands-on capability to train people in an environment uh, that is applicable to their trade. And our workforce specifically, you know, is an ageing workforce, a retiring workforce. So as we lose those skills, you know, where are we training the people for, them for the future, whether it be high tech or whether, whether it be service equipment? I, I, there is a, there's, there's a big gap and it's, it's a major challenge. Um, other questions on, perhaps if we go to the room, anybody has a question here? Please, could you just wait for the microphone? Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. So I'm Sarah Sharples. I'm a um, Chief Scientific Advisor for the Department for Transport, but actually I'm sort of here really as a Professor of Human Factors at Nottingham um, and also Chair of the Advisory Board to the UK Manufacturing Forum. So um, I'm sort of wearing two hats. Um, I actually had a question about this 
perennial challenge that we have um, in terms of the translation of the excellence of the UK in discovery research into um, uh, the reality of scale-up innovation and manufacturing. And I was just wondering what the panel's views were about where those blockers really are, because what I've heard, and I've been doing some sneaky sort of checking of some of the reports, and I had a bit of a penny drop moment. The science and technology framework, that's sort of my Bible as a chief scientific advisor, mentions, now I've written it down, mentions engineering five times, but three of them are in context of engineering biology, and mentions manufacturing once. Um, now, that's my fault as a chief scientific advisor for not spotting that when we were um, helping the development of that. Um, and then, actually, there's lots of mention of, the of research in the advanced manufacturing plan, but I'm wondering if research into how to make manufacturing and scale up better is something that's falling between those two ports, and I'd be really interested in uh, the panel's views. Oh, great question. Thank you. Who'd like to attempt to start addressing that particular one? Oliver? So, uh, my, my coming, I mean, I'm, I'm welcome, Michael, to you as well. I mean, so I, th I think that is absolutely it's a challenge that, w that, that kind of needs to be addressed. Um, I think, you know, we've, I think, really recognised some of the kind of big investments that we've made about that kind of importance of kind of bringing manufacturing research excellence kind of together. So I'd, I'd use the example of the high value manufacturing catapult, actually. Mm. Um, and you know, a really, I think, significant government investment that is focused, I think, on bringing together universities, manuf manufacturing, ma manufacturing um, firms. And to my point about ecosystems, one I think that has really been creating around it th that kind of ecosystem of kind of skills, expert, uh, sort of expert, uh, sort of expertise, that's kind of really kind of creating a kind of world leading, world leading kind of locus. I think on 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 sort of applying. Um, Science research ideas in the kind of manufacturing in the manufacturing domain. Um, of course, like an area that we well, like, undoubtedly we kind of want to do more in. But I think I think it's a really good case study of where we're doing not a bad job at all. Some of the evidence has shown that the, where there is scale up funding, it tends to be for non manufacturing companies, where the ability to, to scale uh, the delivery of a service company or a software company is re still very challenging, but very different from an advanced manufacturing, a manufactured technology. So I guess is there something around that we still haven't quite got right? I don't know. Carlos, did you want to add any comment on this point? I think I would just go back to the, this point in the report about the two worlds, and we need to think of those two worlds in conjunction. Mm. I think it is really surprising how many times you talk to scientists in different universities, our colleagues working in biotech, for example, and you ask them, what is this research applied, or what is it going to be scaled up, or which kind of companies are you working with in actually applying? Well, they say usually other countries. Uh, examples just not, right now we were talking uh, in the US, uh, or a lot of the planned science that we do in Cambridge goes to Switzerland. So. I think it's not necessarily a bad thing, but we just need to be to have that picture mm -hmm. of how those two worlds interact and what kind of industrial competitiveness the research is benefiting. Not only because we want to think about it strategically, but also because we forget to ask what kind of priorities in terms of technologies our sectors require and how can we do bring those two worlds together. So I think we need to have those questions at the same time. Excellent point. Thank you. Charles, Can you, you start, Dr. Charles, good please. to see you again. Um, R&D takes capital investment, which comes with a, a level of risk. And Oliver talked about creating an environment that's conducive to the business. I think we need to sort of have a look and think about whether it's homegrown or foreign direct investment. How do we make the UK an attractive place for people to invest in research and development and then translate that into products, manufacturing, mm -hmm. and ultimately jobs? No, yeah, great point. Um, I have a few final uh, comments uh, to make, if I may. First of all, a big thank you to all of you, both in the room and online, for joining us here today. It's much appreciated. Thank you to our speakers for uh, setting the scene so well. Thank you to all the panellists for responding, for preparing so well and responding to so, so well to some of the, the broad issues of that report. Um, if, and also thanks to all those who contributed to the report as well. There was a huge amount of input gathered, and we're very, very grateful for that. And if you're interested in being part of 
uh, the next edition, the fifth edition, uh, please get in touch with the CIIP team. Um, that same team are very willing, very willing, to come and talk at uh, your organisation should you wish to know more about the report. Um, please uh, do download, read and share the report. Um, it, as we've seen all the way through this, it's, it, it provides that essential data we need to make sure we can support the UK's ongoing industrial competitiveness and we're not short of issues that need addressing. So with that, um, I'm just going to say, could you please join me in giving our panellists in particular and our speakers a very warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.